Good morning again, everyone. I hope everyone's enjoying their breakfast. Please, uh, please continue to enjoy if you're still working on it. Uh, and I'd like to introduce once again uh, Mayor Kevin Davis to bring his greetings on behalf of the City of Brantford. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Isn't it great to have an excuse to dress up again? I've been waiting two years for that. So I'm very happy to be here with my friends from the Great Brantford Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank very much the Chamber of Commerce, the staff, the board. There's a lot of work that you know that the Chamber has done through the pandemic, starting with, uh, of course, the most significant being the testing program, the testing kits that were distributed. And I've really come to value my relationship with the Chamber. We meet monthly, myself and Brian Hutchings, the city CEO, with the uh, top executive, David Prang, and of course, board chair. And it's been very useful to me to have the business perspective through the pandemic, when of course we can't get out and mix, we weren't able to. Also wanted to recognize we have uh, some senior city staff here, down below us here, we have the fire chief, we have the city CAO, we have some of the senior directors and general managers of the city. And I wanna say briefly, I, I've seen behind the scenes the work that these people have done through the pandemic, and it's been amazing. They've done some great things and the commitment they have to our city and the greater community uh, really was one, they're, they're my heroes and they're my heroes for the pandemic. So thank you very much for everything you did. But the real reason why I bullied myself up into the stage today uh, <laughs> is that there's something really important happening next week. This is the most important thing to our community and it's, it's about being our time our time to have a new and upgraded hospital. And we're at a critical stage with the provincial funding request at stage one. If that's approved, the planning can begin in earnest and will be on the list of communities that are going to receive, over the next decade sometime, an upgraded hospital. And so we've got to, we have to, You're going to see next week a great campaign started by the hospital, the Hospital Foundation. And the key is we, not just the leaders, but the entire community, businesses, employees, residents, we've got to get behind and send and tell Queen's Park we want that stage one funding approved. And it won't happen because there's lots of communities competing for this unless we speak as one voice. So it'll be coming up. You'll be told how you can help, how your employees can help. Please do it. Let's get it over the finish line for that stage one because it's our time for a new hospital. Yes, I can absolutely echo that. As a business community, it may not seem like a hospital is, you know, a business issue, but I think every employer here knows how important a good hospital is to attract and retain good employees. And so we, we totally echo that comment. It is absolutely critical for our community, for our business community, for the people of Brantford and Brant to have a top-notch Brantford General Hospital. Uh, so please continue to enjoy what uh, remains of your breakfast, and uh, we'd like to welcome those who are joining us virtually today. Uh, we have a, a great setup here, and uh, we're going to begin our conversation with our MP and MPP about issues identified by the Chamber shortly. Uh, but we would first like to hear from our sponsors. Please welcome uh, Dr. Deborah McLatchy, President and Vice Chancellor from Wilfrid Laurier University Brantford Campus. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and good morning everyone. It is great to see everybody today. And I am so pleased that Laurier is sponsoring this important community event alongside our, alongside our post-secondary colleagues from Conestoga College and Six Nations Polytechnic. And thank you to the Chamber for making this event possible. And a special thanks to uh, MP Larry Brock and MPP Will Boma for taking the time to share their insights with the business community today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate and recognize my colleague, Dr. Heidi Northwood, who many of you know, 
As the senior executive officer of the Brantford campus, Heidi has recently also taken on the role of senior executive officer global strategy, overseeing the development of an international strategy for our university across all of our campuses and locations. I imagine that for many of us, this is one of our first in-person events since last year. And I'm grateful we can gather again as we build this community. It has been a challenging two years. I've been inspired by how we have worked together through this difficult time. I'm very glad that Laurier was able to host the community's mass vaccination clinics at One Market. By the end of last summer, more than 75,000 vaccine doses had been administered at the site. While our students were away from campus, we were also able to transform a student residence into a shelter through a partnership with the city. Operated by Rosewood House, the shelter provided housing for the community's most vulnerable in their time of need. And as we move forward from the pandemic, I'm excited to build on the spirit of community as we collectively create a reinvigorated and thriving Brantford focused on future readiness. We're thrilled that our students are back on campus. Laurier is known for our excellent academics and our exceptional student experience. Having our students, faculty, and staff back on campus means we can achieve our academic mission to its fullest. We also recognize how important our students are to a thriving community in Brantford. In the year prior to the pandemic, our students injected almost $17 million in direct spending into the local community. This year, we support, we, to support local businesses, Lori added $500 to the one-card balance of each incoming full-time first-year undergraduate student in Brantford, which they could spend on groceries and at downtown eateries. The same $500 one-card top-up was provided to incoming Brantford campus graduate students thanks to the generous support of Enterprise Brant. But Laurier students do more than just inject money into the local economy. Our students are engaged and aware citizens who work for area businesses and organizations, sharing their skills, knowledge, and passion to make a stronger Brantford. In 2019, our user experience design students collaborated with the City of Brantford to enhance the city's ice rink program, creating a digitized reporting tool to streamline reporting work for volunteers. The system was unveiled for the rink ice season this year. That is just one example of some of the experiential learning activities our students engage in in the Brantford community. In the last decade, Laurier students have contributed more than 65,000 community service learning hours to over 150 local organizations. 74 students have been in community and workplace positions since this last year alone. And in the last four years, our social work students have logged over 96,000 placement hours with Brantford agencies. We are very pleased to be welcoming students, not just from Ontario, but from around the world to Laurier through the Laure Wilfrid Laurier International College and our partnership with Navitas, a global leader in international education. At WLIC, located here in Brantford, International students spend one year in a highly customized academic program with social supports and then continue their degree studies at Laurier. Planned student growth at our Brantford campus includes programs leading to careers in high demand employment areas in Ontario and nationally in support of post-pandemic economic growth and social supports. These high demand programs are expected to drive both domestic and international student growth and future employment. We can't talk about all of them today, but I hope you will be seeing announcements over the coming months of what's in store. And we are also excited about our continued development of spaces to support academic and student life, including the reimagining of One Market as a central campus and community hub. Much like the Laurier Brantford YMCA is a facility for both students and the community, One Market will be a space for arts, culture, and community for Brantford residents, visitors, and students. It has been so rewarding to work with many of you here in, the, in this room to adapt and reuse many historical buildings in the downtown 
in addition to the new facilities like our purpose-built research and academic center and the Laurier Brantford Y. I know there are a few people here who remember those first years of Laurier and Brantford with our initial class of 39 students in the Carnegie Building. I take great pride in looking back on those days and seeing how far we've all come together. Truly, it is an honor to continue to be part of this community and to contribute to its success. Thank you to all of our partners with whom we've worked and will continue to work to build a thriving community that develops future-ready people who are transforming where we live, work, and learn. Thank you. And I'd, oh, you me, oh, and I'd now like to welcome Jacinda Reitzman from Conestoga College to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. I uh, bring greetings on behalf of President John Tibbetts, who is not able to be here today. But as Vice President of the College, I'm pleased to share his comments on his behalf. It was almost exactly 10 years ago that our President joined the Brantford Mayor, President of Laurier, to announce that Conestoga would begin delivering programming to downtown Brantford in September 2012. Um, the plan was to start modestly with just a couple of programs in space shared with Laurier and then expand as conditions allowed to better meet local and provincial needs. Um, with outstanding support from the city, local business and the Brantford Brant community, we've accomplished a great deal over the last 10 years. And I'm just going to share with you now a, a few highlights. I'm sure I'll miss a couple of things, but some very exciting things that have, that have happened with Conestoga. So first of all, significant program and enrollment growth aligned with the identified labour force needs of the local community and province of Ontario. Conestoga's Brantford campus now serves approximately 1,000 full-time students across a broad range of programs, including business, community services, liberal, liberal studies, trades and apprenticeships. While many students have been studying remotely through the pandemic, we look forward to a full reopening of Brantford and other campuses at Conestoga in March, so coming very soon. As well as serving local students, the Conestoga Brantford campus has attracted more than 700 students from all around the world. We, we appreciate the very warm welcome they have received in this community. Since opening our operations in Brantford, Conestoga has purchased and leased multiple properties in the city to support program delivery needs and establish a strong local presence that provides a full on-campus experience for students in collaboration with Laurier and our shared student services approach. Conestoga now delivers hands-on trades education and training at the Brantford Municipal Airport, including heavy equipment operator, automotive repair and electrical techniques, as well as some agricultural programs, just to name a few. The airport location also includes dual credit programming through the School College Work Initiative that provides hands-on learning opportunities for more than 100 local secondary students, which is just a, a wonderful initiative. Community services programming delivered in Brantford is connected directly to workforce development and community needs, including early childhood education, human services foundations, mental health and substance use, and management and community services. A few years ago, we purchased and renovated the Municipal Child Care Centre on Clarence Street and provide child care services in partnership with Six Nations. The Child Care Centre also functions as a living lab for our ECE program. We are also currently working with the community to develop more programming in community safety, so stay tuned for more details. One of the exciting things that did happen during the pandemic is with donor support, we opened an on-site lab uh, for the delivery of PSW training back in March 2021. And as we all know, there's such a need for, for PSWs, um, those who work in healthcare, and the on-site model has really helped position Conestoga as Ontario's leader in PSW training, and we're very committed uh, to that initiative. Also, in November 2020, we opened an IELTS, that's an English language testing center in Brantford. In the past year alone, it has served over 1,600 test takers who otherwise would have had to go to other cities. 
Our strong connections with the local community include involvement with Downtown Brantford Improvement Task Force, Local Food Bank and Library, Workforce Planning Board, Brantford Immigration Partnership, Citywide Cleanup Campaign for Earth Day, Grand Valley Education Society, Strategic Trades Alliance, and of course, the Brantford Brant Chamber of Commerce. In summary, Conestoga remains committed to continued growth and investment in Brantford as we currently explore some new and interesting opportunities. We are very excited about the future and look forward to working with our elected representatives, with businesses and the community to address workforce needs, support Ontario's economic recovery, and provide opportunities for individuals from all backgrounds to launch successful futures. We also appreciate the partnership and support from our post-secondary education partners, Wilfrid Laurier University and Six Nations Polytechnic. On behalf of Conestoga, I'd like to offer my deepest thanks for your continued support of our college and for providing a wonderful experience for our students here in Brantford and Brant County. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker from Six Nations Polytechnic, Linda Parker. Thank you very much. Good morning. I feel like a kid on a school trip. First time out in a long time. <laughs> anyway, sago and hello. As many of you know, the Haudenosaunee like to begin gatherings by giving thanks. We give greetings and thanks to each other to bring our minds together as one. We acknowledge the natural world. We give thanks to the sun, moon, stars, the winds and rains, the medicines, and all plant and animal life for helping to sustain us. We thank our creator for providing everything we need to live a good life. Nyawa. I could think of no greater words to share today than a message of gratitude. But before I continue, I need everyone to understand that when I say Nyawa, I'm saying thank you. Say the word with me, please. Nyawa. 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 Awesome. Don't forget to say it when I'm done. <laughs> COVID has created hardships and challenges on a scale that most of us have never endured. But we are all here today, in person or virtually, and for that I am grateful. Nyawa. Since last year's MP MPP event, SNP delivered 22 signature and partner-based programs, both in online and hybrid formats. We held the inaugural graduation of the SNP STEAM Academy, our science, technology, engineering, arts, and math-focused high school. We received approval to deliver an honors Bachelor of Arts in Ongwehomi languages. We are thrilled that delivery of this critical, of this credential, sorry, aligns with the start of the UNESCO International Decade of Indigenous Languages. SNP also solidified and expanded our Brantford footprint. We purchased the campus at 411 Elgin Street. We now have two facilities on 24 acres to deliver our secondary, post-secondary, apprenticeship, and skilled trades programming. We are grateful to everyone that played a role in this success. Mr. Bauma. Yeah. <laughs> SNP is also grateful for the changes in our post-secondary education system. Recognizing the value of short-term stackable learning is an essential step to rebuilding our communities. With financial support from Ontario, SNP delivered a suite of micro-credentials available soon through eCampus Ontario to support virtual learning. Some of these include exploring indigenous foods and food sovereignty, increasing math skills for skilled trades learners, and voices of Haudenosaunee women. The voices of Haudenosaunee women are inspired by and feature the works of authors from Six Nations. They share their lived experiences and their traditional and contemporary roles as women. The mastermind behind this course is Judy Rubin, please stand, Six Nations author and director of the SNP STEAM Academy. Nyawa. <laughs> SNP is grateful for the continued investments by Canada and Ontario. I am particularly grateful for the commitment to improve access to connectivity. This is a true step toward equality and inclusion. Nyawa. 
COVID has challenged all of us, particularly our students, but SNP is better prepared to serve our communities. We've achieved this by listening and responding to the teaching and learning community with much help from our post-secondary partners and all levels of government. Yeah. Working in partnership is a proven way to respectful interdependence while maintaining our unique and distinct identities. I want to close by highlighting SNP's capacity to participate and contribute to economic recovery through job creation, upskilling and reskilling, closing the socioeconomic gaps between Indigenous peoples and Canadians, and national issues such as reconciliation. SNP's Indigenous Knowledge Centre, the Yohahage, which means two roads or two streams of knowledge, has many resources to support this work. I encourage you to reach out to SNP as you begin this work. We are here to help. Reconciliation is important work, and it will take all of us working together to create a process to learn and understand this nation's history, our shared history and respond strategically in a way that empowers Indigenous peoples to reach their full potential while benefiting all who share this land. Nyawa. Nyawa. I'd like to invite President Paul back to the podium, please. <laughs> Thank you very much once again to all of our sponsors. I think they deserve another round of applause. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our MP and MPP who are here with us today. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, MP Larry Brock, who was first elected to the House of Commons on September 20th, 2021, as a member of parliament for Brantford Brant and is currently serving as the Deputy Shadow Minister for Justice, Attorney General. Uh, of Canada, uh, Deputy Shadow Minister for Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Uh, Larry has a bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo and a law degree from the University of Calgary. Before being elected, he was the Assistant Crown Attorney for Brandt. A lifelong resident of Brandt, Larry has demonstrated strong leadership and commitment to family, community and public service, having served as a chair of the board of Crossing All Bridges a adult learning center which helps adults with developmental difficulties succeed in education, employment, and independent living. He was also president of St. Leonard's Community Services, which provides justice, employment, youth and family, uh, addiction, and mental health services. And in 2015, he served as the chair of the United Way campaign, which raised more than $1.6 million for the community. Larry and his wife, Angela, are proud parents of 12-year-old twin daughters, Jenny and Emma. Prior to being elected as MPP for Brant for Brant, uh, Will Balma served as a Brant counselor in 2014, where I believe he coined the phrase Brant-tastic, uh, following eight years of service for the Committee of Adjustment. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, I've, I've been misinformed. <laughs> MPB Bauma also currently serves as a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance, the Honorable, Honorable Peter Bethlen Falvey. Will has been a member of Brant County Board of Health, the Brant Waterways Foundation, and has volunteered with local fire department since 2008. After graduating with a Doctor of Optometry degree, Will chose Brantford Brant as the best place to live, work, and raise a family. He practices in the village of St. George, where he resides with his wife Joni and their five children. Please welcome Larry and Will to the stage. Thank you, uh, Larry and, and Will, for joining us today. I know everyone here is, is clamoring to hear the words of wisdom you have to share and uh, your perspectives. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on that, so maybe. So uh, we have uh, several topics. We'll try and get through them. Uh, we'll, we'll try and keep our responses to, to four minutes each and keep a, a balanced uh, conversation. But uh, I think, uh, more importantly, let's, let's engage in dialogue if there's, if there's times where 
you know, there's a, a jumping off point, feel free to, to jump in, but uh, happy to have you here. Uh, I thank Larry and Will, both of you, for your commitment to serving our community. Uh, donations on their behalf have been made to the following charities of their choice. Uh, for Larry Brock, Crossing All Bridges Learning Center, <coughs> and for Will Bauma, the Why Not Youth Center. Uh, I'd like to thank Pink's Productions for their audiovisual experience and for helping us create a hybrid option for our members today who are watching from their offices or homes. And once again, we would like to acknowledge and thank our post-secondary partners who have generously sponsored today's event. Yes. Yahweh. Yeah, Once again, uh, if you haven't had a chance, please visit their information tables at the back of the room here. And uh, please take a moment and note the details listed on today's agenda of our upcoming events. Our uh, annual general meeting and president's event sponsored by Advantage Group, uh, the 38th annual Business Excellence Awards presenting sponsor BDO, and our annual golf tournament. Lots of details to follow about golf. Uh, thank you very much everyone for attending. Uh, so let's get started, and uh, I think I would be remiss if we didn't have some time focused on the situation in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, could, could you maybe offer your perspective, and we'll start with you, Larry, on the invasion of Ukraine by Russia this week? What yes. impact will this government, uh, will this have on, on the priorities of, of the government as well as our local community? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I want to thank uh, the Chamber of uh, Commerce for hosting this important event. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Laurier, Conestoga, and Six Nations Polytechnic. I want to thank all our guests, all our distinguished guests, and people who are watching online. I'd like to start by um, reading out a post that I posted uh, yesterday evening on, on Facebook on the uh, issue in, in Ukraine. Today we stand in solidarity with the innocent people of Ukraine. Uh, Putin's senseless attack on Ukraine is deplorable, unacceptable, and further demonstrates a complete abuse of power. Now more than ever, we must stand united to defend the rules of international law and against these violations of international law. Please keep the citizens of Ukraine and Ukrainian Canadians in your thoughts and prayers. It was heartbreaking when I turned on the news this morning to see the uh, collateral uh, damages caused to the infrastructure in Ukraine, the number of uh, dead civilians, the number of uh, incidents of incursions all across that particular country. I don't think he's going to stop until he captures Kiev and captures the airport. It is absolutely senseless and deplorable. Mm -hmm. So while I can't speak on behalf of the Canadian government, I, I'm not privy to any sort of uh, decisions that are being made at, uh, at the government level, I can tell you that Canada will stand united and will offer whatever assistance that we can. We have already contributed uh, millions and millions of dollars in aid, we have recently sent over uh, ammunition and arms as requested uh, by the Ukrainian uh, government. How NATO is going to play into this remains to be seen. Clause number five, I, I would suspect, is about to be uh, looked at very, very carefully. Uh, we don't know if Mr. Putin is going to be content with just uh, his invasion of Ukraine or whether or not it's going to extend into uh, NATO countries. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do pray for a peaceful, peaceful resolution sooner than later. We must stand united and uh, stand strong against this, uh, this senseless act. Well, it, it might be challenging to speak from a provincial perspective, but uh, surely there are some implications at, at home to this um, catastrophic situation abroad. No, yeah, I, uh, I completely echo Larry's comments. I think. Uh, it was so good yesterday morning, just before question period, to be present while the entire chamber um, stood together in support of um, Ukraine, the people of Ukrainian descent here in this country. They're such a vital part of the, our cultural fabric here locally and across the entire province. And uh, we've committed to stand with Ukraine. We've also contributed some, some, some amount of money. I believe that's just a token 
a few hundred thousand dollars as a province. And uh, last night as I was leaving the legislature at, uh, oh, it was about seven o'clock, um, you know, I saw someone walking by with their family with a Ukrainian flag. And I just stopped and said our hearts are with you and your people as you go through this. I hope that in time to come, we don't look back at, uh, as, at, on this as the opportunity that we as the West had to stop a strong man. And I'm sure those are thoughts that I've had going all the way back to 19, uh, 1930s and 40s. I can understand why we do not want to enter into an engagement with uh, Russia and yet at the same time, I don't see where this will end. On, uh, if I could speak federally, if I could speak provincially, I would say it makes it ever more imperative <coughs> that uh, Canada, Ontario become energy independent. You know, Putin holds all the cards in Europe because he holds their energy supplies. And I know Larry will 100% stand with me that it is critical that this country stand together and fully utilize our natural resources so that Canada can be not only energy independent, but that we can fill that gap for Europe and our allies there so that they can, don't have to be dependent on this petty bully who seeks to uh, re uh, bring back a new uh, Soviet state with his oligarchs. And uh, we cannot stand for this. We have to do everything possible. But I know my boys are all that age. I don't want to see them go there and have to do this. But we have to use every tool at our disposal. And that may mean higher gas prices, higher energy prices, higher inflation. But I think we all have to stand together and bear that for the people of Ukraine so that we could end this as quickly as possible and put Mr. Putin back in his place. Will you speak to, uh, you speak to sanctions and implications to foreign trade, specifically in the energy sector, uh, that go beyond what we've currently sanctioned as a, as a country? Uh, the entire Western world has been pretty united in identifying the, the Article 5 implications that Ukraine is not uh, an Article 5 NATO ally mm -hmm. uh, and so the Western world has withheld military assistance at this time. Mm -hmm. Do you think the sanctions that are in place currently go far enough? We have to hit them where it hurts and it hurts in their oil and gas exports. That's why Ontario cannot be dependent on a line five that runs through the United States <coughs> That's why we have to stand together to make sure that we can get energy from the east to the west, through Ontario, through Quebec, both in oil and gas. That's now more important than ever. And I believe it would be inherently important for the American president to get uh, the Keystone XL accelerated at this point so that we can see Canadian energy flow to our American partners in this also. We need to be able to be not just energy independent, but supply our partners with the energy that they need so that they don't have to kowtow and bow down to this strong man. And Ontario has a role to play in that. I believe our Indigenous people have a strong role to play in that too. And that's a tricky negotiation piece, what that would look like to be able to get energy safely across this country from one end to the other. But I think there's bigger issues at play here that we all have to stand together on. But I am not the federal member. But what it means, it makes it ever more important that the province of Ontario stand with our businesses stand with our people so that we can be the economic engine and powerhouse of the entire country so that united we can weather this stand strong make it through the sanctions because of course any interruption in in in, in trade is hard on us but we can get through this and i think we put the pieces in place that we can also weather this storm just as we have the last two years together thank you larry the uh the sanctions that are in place federally. Um, what are your thoughts on their relevancy uh, on the world stage? Critics uh, from around the globe are opining that they are not strong enough. I don't know what other stronger uh, incentives that governments would have to, to levy those sanctions. We have to cripple, we have to absolutely cripple the financial sector in Russia to finally get this message through to him that the world is not on his side. Uh, history is going to reveal that uh, he was, in the words of my colleague here, a bully, a bully that needs to stop. 
I was rather, uh, I was rather upset to hear that the United Nations yesterday turned down a, a resolution to utilize the SWIFT uh, banking uh, protocol to essentially stop all funds in and out of Russia. And I think it's high time that we took a look at that banking mechanism and actually choked off all, uh, all influences of, of, uh, of any political views, uh, any money coming in, in and out of that country. We have to choke it off. And I think that hopefully will get uh, the message to Mr. Putin that he just uh, does not have the world on his side. He does not have the economies. And uh, it's quite frankly, if, if we can attack the, the banking industry in Russia and attack the, uh, the, uh, the oligarchs and uh, some of the wealthier people in that country, he might listen to his own people as opposed to what the leaders around the world are saying with respect to his actions. So I'm hoping that stronger sanctions are going to have an impact. I, don't, I just don't know, not being part of the government, as to what is in the arsenal of the Canadian government to levy anything more. Well, a week ago, I wouldn't have thought uh, that the COVID pandemic would play second fiddle to any issue, but here we are. Um, as dynamic, as complex, as catastrophic as the issue in Ukraine is, we still have issues at home uh, related to the COVID pandemic. Um, this gathering today indicates a, a glimmer of hope that maybe we're, we're coming out of some of the more restrictive measures. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, over the, the course of the pandemic, what did the government do to deliver wins in this COVID situation? And, and where do you think the government fell short? Uh, what, what have we learned from the, this experience that we could apply, hopefully not have to apply, but learn from? Well, I'll start with the losses. The man that I work for uh, carries the burdens of 15 million people on his shoulders every day. And I know that may sound fawning, but it's absolutely true. That's why when I text the Premier, it's not uncommon for me to get a response at 3 o'clock in the morning because he's still working. Since the last time we had a moment of silence in the House for the victims of COVID, there's been another over 2,200 people that have passed away from this disease. That is the difficult part. We feel the loss of every job. We feel the loss of every loved one. Every missed day of school. Every opportunity for gain. Um, deeply. And yet, since the beginning, I am very, very proud of our record as a government to be able to achieve, and actually even more than that, it's way bigger than that because it's over 90% of the people of the province of Ontario that have chosen to get their vaccine, that have for the most part followed the restrictions. That's why we have had the successes that we've had. All you have to do is look around at our neighbours and you'll see that there is 30, 40,000 people still alive in the province of Ontario. That would not have happened if we had not taken the steps as a society that we did. And that kind of a pro-life message in a time and a day like this is just so, so exciting for me. On the financial side, we have supported our hospitals and I fight every day for that community planning grant. The Premier is tired of hearing me about it. My Minister is tired of hearing about it. And the Minister of Health is tired of hearing about it. But that's why I love what the mayor said this morning, that we all have to work together because it cannot just be my voice to get that here. But the investments that we've made in healthcare, the over 1,000 new ICU beds that we have opened, the almost 300 new beds that we have announced in long-term care here locally, and another couple of hundred of redeveloped beds here locally, the money that we put into supports, all over $50,000 uh, $50, uh, for small businesses that they can apply for as grants, let alone deferred tax payments, the, um, um, the energy cost rebates that we've done, the, the rental assistance programs that we have done. Have people suffered? Yes, absolutely. The efficiencies that, efficiencies that we've been able to offer, the funding for efficiencies in, in the city to, to do that, the supports for the transit systems to keep them going. The educations are, uh, our investments in the education sector, the HEPA filters and all those pieces. Have there been mistakes? You bet. Anyone here involved in government, you know, when we, I learned this at county council, 80% of what we do is spend time trying to fix the unintended consequences of well-intended legislation. Absolutely. Now throw in a 
global pandemic when you're making decisions on the fly. In hours instead of months and years. You bet. But look at our record as a society and how many people are still here with us today. It is huge. Financially, one year ago, and I was working with the Ministry of Finance when I was still in the Premier's office to get to deliver the budget uh, a year ago. We were staring down a $31 billion deficit when we put out our budget last year. Because of the supports to businesses, because of the steps that we have taken to enable our innovators to do well in the province of Ontario, we were able to decrease that $31 billion to $22 billion in the fall for the fall economic statement. Since then, as the Auditor General just published this week, we've taken off another $8.4 billion from that total. We're down to $13 billion deficit with all the supports that we've put in. Building hospitals, building long-term care, investing in education, taking care of our most vulnerable. We now have a smaller deficit heading into this election than we were given by the previous government with none of these situations going. So I am proud of our people. I am mostly proud of everyone here. I'm actually a little giddy this morning. This is the biggest event that I've been at. And it just, <laughs> it's so good to see so many friends. And you know what makes the difference? Partners like the mayor of Brantford, who absolutely works with me every single day. Partners like our hospital, where we fight together with the Ministry of Health and with government in order to get the um, the funding that we need in this community. Not to mention with the city of Brantford as we work towards a new courthouse. Starting from scratch four years ago, our hospital was nowhere on the agenda or line of sight for a redevelopment in the province. These take decades. And we're, now we're this close to maybe getting that community planning grant. Same thing in our court system. We don't have a Gladue court. We don't have a unified family court. It was nowhere on the Ministry of the Attorney General's radar that we do anything with our court system. And we are this close to being able to move forward on something like that. Moving people, the investment into, I see you John McAlpine, that new interchange at Bishopsgate Road on the 403. So that, you know, as talking, and, and the relationship with the Chamber of Commerce and Paul, and realizing that we need to be able to find innovative ways of getting people to and from work. I know I'm taking way too much time. But having you three up my time. higher education, <laughs> three, three centers of higher education that are nimble and fast on their feet so that we can get a college of education here. And I keep bugging Minister Dunlop about that. And she promises she won't come back here until she can give me good news. I don't have an appointment yet. But having a university that can turn around quickly on their feet Having a college like Conestoga that can develop new programs so that we can get these things going at the airport and just like at the drop of a hat and working. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. You have no idea how much it means to be the partnership that we have had in order to secure your facility into the future so that you're not renting a space that could be sold, but that is yours in perpetuity. That is huge. Maybe one of the single biggest wins Actually, no, the single biggest wins, I'll tell you, was, uh, was uh, um, birth alerts. Birth alerts. Did you know that up until a couple years ago, a young, young, young woman who, who was pregnant but came, came from a disadvantaged socioeconomic background could walk into a hospital, have a baby, and that baby would automatically be taken away regardless, regardless of her ability to take care of that child? Can you imagine being treated that way? That happened 239 odd times in this province every single year. And when Minister Dunlop was that, that minister and we went to Six Nations and we heard these stories from Arla Skye and her team there and Minister Dunlop walked out of that meeting and she said, I don't care what I have to do, I'm gonna make that go away. And we did. I will stop, and Larry can have the rest of the time because that was completely unfair. Well, that, that was three extra minutes, but uh, <laughs> Larry, Larry, from your federal perspective, uh, acknowledging you're in the opposition party, but 
what successes has the federal government had in handling this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? And then what can we learn from moving forward? Well, firstly, thank you, Will, for stealing a lot of my thunder <laughs> on that particular question. But nevertheless, um, I, I think I would be remiss if I did not highlight the, the thrust of my colleagues' uh, comments that um, although we can look at successes, we can take a look at lessons learned, we must, we must never forget and lament the loss, the suffering, not only in this country, but around the world. And part of the dialogue that we are currently having, in fact, we've had literally since Parliament started on the 22nd of November, is vaccine equity around the world. It's one thing for a G7 country to take whatever steps are necessary to secure vaccinations, first and second, and booster vaccinations for everyone in this country. And kudos to the Trudeau government for taking those appropriate steps. But we must never forget that there are countries around the world that do not have that ability. And until such time as we take a leadership role to ensure that the entire world has access, timely access to all the vaccinations and the boosters that we have, it's just around the corner that another variant is going to rear its ugly head and we're gonna be right down this rabbit hole again. So we have to look at the larger picture when we take a look at life beyond the experience that we've all went through for the last two years. So that's one comment. Successes, um, there has been critics who have, and you know, hindsight's 20, always 2020. Looking through the rear view mirror, as my, as my colleague had said, we had to make decisions, the government had to make decisions with very little information and sometimes conflicting information. Sometimes the messaging that we heard from the World Health Organization differed from our own scientists in Canada and differed from the center of uh, diseases in uh, the United States. So it was very easy for people to criticize the mixed messaging, but the heart was there. We can never forget that these people tried their best to give the best scientific opinion to our leaders so that they could be guided in determining what is in all our best interests. Yes, mistakes were made. Yes, mixed messages, which created some of the conspiracy theories that still exist today as to whether or not these vaccinations are safe. As a conservative member of the Conservative Party of Canada, I can proudly state to this entire crowd and can be quoted anywhere at any time that I believe that vaccinations are safe. I will always maintain that position. So yes, the government did the best that they could. It could have happened a lot sooner. There could have been less deaths, less complications to a number of Canadians, but certainly life lessons can be learned from this. And I think what it did was, is it exposed the frailties of our health system. Not necessarily in Ontario, but every province and territory uh, in this country. Hallway medicine has always been an issue with respect to our health care for decades leading up to this pandemic. This pandemic only exacerbated that situation. It clearly was a wake-up call to all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, that we must work in collaboration to ensure that our health care facilities are world-class, that the necessary infrastructure adjustments and the money to make those adjustments is there. We are pushing as part of the conservative platform in the last election was increasing, doubling the amount of health transfers to the province to make them targeted, to make recommendations to the provinces on ways that they could use that money to improve our health care system. 
let's face it, we heard about the problems in the ICU units across this country two years ago, and we're still hearing about the same problems, and nothing's been done. Two years, there could have been some changes. The money was flowing. We have to make sure that the money is targeted and it's addressing those inequities and those inefficiencies. If we want to make sure that we have a first-class healthcare system that's always publicly funded, and I will defend with my last breath the public funded system that we have here in Canada, we have to make adjustments. So that's what I would suggest uh, as my observations of strengths and, and weaknesses. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we, we understand the deep personal sacrifices uh, that, that Will was talking about that have uh, been the toll that we continue to, to wrestle with individually and, and, and corporately and as a community. Uh, but as we look to recovery, as we look to returning, maybe not to normal, but to a new normal, uh, some barriers still exist. Immigration, labor shortages, housing, the supply of which. Uh, where are people going to live? How will they afford a home in the current market? What policies on, on these, these roadblocks to recovery could the, the federal government support to, to try and smooth the process uh, towards a recovery? That is a multifaceted <laughs> question. Take, take your point. That, that four minutes certainly would you just have, scratch the surface. You have seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, again, it, it's too easy for opposition uh, members of parliament, particularly in my own caucus, to heavily criticize the government's decisions that we supported, that we voted on in support of, that financial measures had to be provided in a very timely basis to workers who have been displaced because of the pandemic, businesses who were suffering because of the pandemic. We had to ensure that there was an immediate source of funds that individuals and businesses could rely upon. That unfortunately has put us in a significant deficit position that according to the latest uh, figures from the Parliamentary Budget Officer and the C.D. Howe Institute may take the current government, if it did exist in government, until the year 2070 to discharge that particular deficit. So obviously we have, we have room to improve the, the, the drawing down of that particular debt with that laneway that we have in front of us. But what it did also uh, expose is that uh, we have some frailties in our immigration system. We had a number of uh, businesses, a lot of large corporations, a lot of farmers that I have spoken to since becoming the Member of Parliament who have lamented about the inability to acquire workers, the inability to, uh, to acquire foreign workers, seasonal workers into our country, the roadblocks, the immigration roadblocks. Right now, the immigration department at uh, the federal level is so backlogged with applications and the directive, and still is the directive uh, from, the, from the parliament that most government employees work from home with reduced caseloads. I know that our constituency office is flooded with concerned constituents going through delay, 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 and through the immigration channels about addressing their particular claims. We need to improve that. We need to find efficiencies with respect to that. Um, the, the latest bill that was passed uh, by the federal government, Bill C-2, uh, reduced the amount of monies made available to, uh, to businesses and to individuals, but the flow of money was still there. Again, there was some criticism and opposition to that. We are not completely out of the woods. Small businesses is the bed bedrock of, of any community across this particular country. They have suffered the most. Uh, I have read and seen abuses of the monies that have been made available by the federal government that was earmarked for small and medium-sized businesses 
that just did not flow to them in, in a timely manner, that a large, there was a large amount of money that was going to large corporations that did not necessarily need it. There's all kinds of instances of fraud of individuals who made application for funds. These individuals did not exist. Um, from the legal side of uh, where I come from, it's frustrating that uh, the current government is not taking the necessary means to address those particular fraudulent issues to make sure that there's a mechanism to recover that because we're talking billions of dollars of, of wasted monies. I think one of the biggest eye-opener for me as, as a young member of parliament is just the amount of government waste. And I'm not being critical, I'm not being hyper-partisan when I say this because the same could have been said when uh, Stephen Harper formed government. This is an issue that needs to be addressed at a federal level that we need to have the appropriate checks and balances right at the beginning to ensure that there is accountability for every dollar, every dollar that we take from you taxpayers that is destined and to be served for the intended purpose, that there is a system to recover uh, from those individuals who abuse and misuse the system and are not being held accountable for that. So I've got a lot more to say, Paul. I know that's probably beyond four or five minutes, but well, you I'm trying to give Well, you generously left two of your minutes from Will. <laughs> okay, <back. laughs> well, okay, well, I'll pass it on to my colleague then. So, Will, immigration, very traditionally is a, is a federal issue. Mm -hmm. However, at the risk of oversimplifying it, uh, a short while ago, the province of Ontario became one of the first jurisdictions to take action on immigration. Yeah. Um, maybe you could expand on that and, and talk to the significance of that. Can you imagine, 23 of my colleagues in my caucus were not born in Canada. Okay? That's a third. I'm one of them. I was speaking to the French consular general who wasn't born in France. How many cultures can you think of where an immigrant can come in not knowing the language and be elected to provincial or federal office within 10 years? Could that happen in Russia? Could that happen in Japan? Could that happen in China? We all know the answer to that. Our culture, thanks to the two-row wampum, is built on the premise of different people coming together and moving in the same direction. That means having a strong immigration policy. That means we're our country is built on bringing in skilled workers from other places who dream of what they could be here. And that's why we are taking action on that, so that we have more economic immigrants here. Because we are 300 jobs sitting open in the province, 300,000 jobs sitting open in the province of Ontario right now. We need people for it. That also means housing. A while ago, Mayor Davis, you said to me, I had no idea how close the relationship between the province and the municipality needs to be in order to get good things done. Neither did I. But it's so true. I have those partnerships here that we are working on to make good things happen together. That has to happen between the federal government, the provincial government, and local government. The key is a little word called NIMBY. Because I get 100 calls from constituents saying, I don't want this here. You get a call from 100 constituents saying, I don't want this here. Only 100? <laughs> the mayor gets a thousand. <laughs> the councillors get two thousand. But we got to look in the mirror and think about what kind of community we want, whether we want to have newcomers come here and share in the incredible community that we have, and that we need to build the place for them to live, work, play, and enjoy everything. Someone let my family into this country. Forty six years ago in April. We need to be that again. And, you know, I was speaking to a young person who desperately wants to buy a house. I was looking for a condo for two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but doesn't want any new development. 
We need to have those conversations. That's the key thing here. So people realize if we want to buy a place, if we want our children to be able to afford a home, we need to look at things differently. Because at the end of the day, we're stuck. We work for you. We do what you want, or we won't be here anymore. That's how it works. So we have to want something different. Not me, not Larry, not Kevin, not Dan, not Greg. Where's my favorite real estate agent? And we have the power to do that. Right there. Oh, yeah, there's you. <laughs> you know, I did that on purpose, just to make you feel special, Mr. Utley. I didn't expect this to be the controversial question. No, but, <laughs> and so, so that's the affordability piece, is we have 150,000 people moving into this province. We need to take some control over what those immigrants look like here and how welcome we make them feel. But we have the power to do that here locally and, uh, and I think that's, that's and from what, I, what I've seen so far over the last four years, we can tackle this problem here and uh, stand together in order to handle those things. Thank you. Uh, on housing, people didn't come here to hear me speak about it, so I'll let your words speak for themselves. Uh, on housing, that requires growth, that requires uh, infrastructure, sewers, uh, electricity, gas, uh, but it also requires transportation infrastructure. If we're going to poise this community for growth, what are the key transportation and infrastructure priorities in this riding that the provincial government aligns itself with? How can we connect to a GO train maybe? How do we direct traffic north and south? Greater KW area, other surrounding communities. So I've decided to take a different approach on that, uh, Paul, and we've talked about that, so you know exactly what I'm going to say, and the mayor has had to go, but um, real simple. Everyone will remember a few years ago, a decade ago, that the provincial government of the day suggested a new route for a 424, and it was widely condemned and not in my backyard, and I understand all of those things. And I decided to flip that problem on its head. And you'll know, I've been here every time talking about the, uh, the absolute necessity for the municipalities to work together regionally in order to come up with a joint regional master transportation plan to give some staff hours to be able to uh, plan that route so that um, we can get good services and people moving where they need to. To bring that to the province to be endorsed. And we're making headway on that. I now have MTO support for that concept. On the go piece, We've been wanting this for decades. Uh, again, I decided to turn that on its head. Instead of waiting for the province to announce something, why don't we bring the municipalities together, the stakeholders together to talk about those things, and then bring in through MTO, which I have support on Metrolinx, to actually ink an agreement that will say when we hit these certain targets, um, this will happen. That way, the municipalities have the ability to do their five-year plans, 10-year plans, and do the community planning around where those stations will be, where that infrastructure needs to be, so that we can hit those targets, that agreement kicks in, and we move forward. Are we there yet? No, but we've had some really good conversations. And at heart, I'm a small town guy, I'm a municipal guy, and those good ideas that happen here locally should be brought up to the province, as opposed to, and we don't like, decisions being made on the 19th floor of an office building in downtown Toronto being pushed down to here. And again, we have that ability, we have great people, we're working with the chamber, been working with the municipalities on those things, and, I'm, and, and that's why, you know, I'm looking forward to over the next four years bringing some of those things to uh, fruition. Thank you. Larry, what role does the federal government play in transportation infrastructure at a local level? Um, go trains, maybe, uh, we also have a, a, an airport. What, what federal initiatives could support uh, reinvigoration of, of local transportation infrastructure? It doesn't play the same role, of course, that my, my provincial counterpart uh, has already indicated, but nevertheless, there is a federal uh, component to that, and I just hearken back to, uh, to both the conservative platform and the liberal platform in the last election that spoke about supporting 
the provincial governments and supporting municipalities to ensure that funds are available for critical infrastructure projects to improve transportation. We are so interconnected as a society, particularly in Ontario, particularly Brantford Brant, Six Nations of the Grant and Mississaugas of the Credit. We are so centrally hubbed with respect to the GTA, KW, to London. We have to ensure that we work in collaboration with our provincial cousins and municipalities to ensure that there is the necessary funding when they need it. But if I could just digress for a moment, and I think this, this might be a nice you segue. You have two extra minutes. Do I? Yeah. Well, I'm going to take advantage <laughs> of that. <clears throat> there, there's an elephant in this room, and I was anticipating, but it's not going to be available. I thought we were going to have a general Q&A, but there is no Q&A after, after this particular session. But in my view, the elephant in the room is the Emergencies Act. And what was the result of of passing that Emergencies Act. And this ties into the question regarding critical infrastructure. We saw what happened uh, at the border crossings in Coots, Alberta. We saw what happened at Emerson, Manitoba. We certainly saw it on a daily basis, what happened at the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor. That can never happen again. The police, law enforcement, whether that be at the municipal level, whether that be through the OPP, whether that be with Indigenous police services, have, have always had all the necessary tools to clear those blockades. And it's not necessarily even looking at a fine balance because I will defend, with my legal background, the constitutionally protected right of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. But those freedoms have never been absolute. They have always been subject to reasonable limits under Section 1 of the Charter. It's one thing to demonstrate your opposition to government policies or government laws or positions that they take with respect to COVID vaccinations and restrictions. It's quite another to completely, deliberately, and illegally block critical infrastructure. That Ambassador Bridge is the heartline between our two great nations. Canada and US, and well over $100 million was lost every single day for the seven days that those truckers and their supporters uh, had, had created that blockade. That blockade was cleared with effective police leadership in conjunction with utilizing other member services from adjoining areas without the imposition of the Emergencies Act. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole right now to address this particular question because that is something that we are debating right now in Ottawa and will continue to debate because we're in the process now of forming a committee to review the decision and then we have the public inquest that's going to follow. Maybe six months from now, we're going to have some clarity as to why it was invoked, whether that was the right thing, whether that was the wrong thing, and what alternatives as a government should have been adopted. That conversation will happen at a later date. But from a federal perspective, that can never happen again. And it's not just bridges, it's blockades of railways, it's blockades of pipelines, anything that is critically necessary for this nation has to be stopped by effective law enforcement. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Our economic recovery uh, requires things like transportation infrastructure, housing, as we discussed, but it also requires skilled labors. Our generous sponsors here today, Wilfrid Laurier, uh, Conestoga College, uh, Six Nations Polytechnic, they're tremendous economic drivers in our community. 
what would you identify as a, the key priority areas of focus in education, training, and skills development? Uh, Larry, we'll start with you. One of the nice things about uh, this role, even though I've been born and raised in this community, there's always things that I'm learning that I didn't know about my, my great community here in Bradford Brant. And one of the meetings I had not too long ago was with the good folks of the Grand Valley Education Society. I know Rick Stern is in the house. I don't know if other members from the society are there, but because of the Grand Valley Educational Society, we have the world-class education, post-secondary education systems that we have here in this particular riding. They were instrumental in negotiating with Laurier's arrival here in Brantford. And look what they've done over the last few decades. So I know that I've, I've listened very carefully to what they've had to say. I know that their overall vision and goal is an academic excellence for this uh, community, that all institutions work in conjunction with each other to ensure that the students who decide to study locally have the necessary skills to contribute immediately to our economy, to our community, but also to be ambassadors to spread out uh, within Ontario and other parts of Canada and internationally, because we are held in very, very high esteem uh, with respect to the quality of education that we have here in Brantford Brant. We should be extremely proud of the institutions that serve us very well. So just listening to the opening comments from all the three representatives from the post-secondary uh, institutions, it's, it's vitally clear to me that there is an emphasis on the skills development that is not necessarily strictly theory. And I hearken back to my days as a young law student in Calgary. Uh, Calgary at that time was a bit of a maverick law program in Canada because instead of teaching theory and studying case law for the three years, they actually felt that we needed to equip tomorrow's lawyers with the critical skills that they need to hit the ground running post-graduation. So essentially half of my three-year um, uh, school term was devoted to essential skill development as to what a practicing lawyer needs. And to hear now from the three representatives of our fine post-secondary education institutions here in Brantford Brant, to hear that that is a focus of their curriculum, okay, I think is, is crucial, absolutely crucial for this community uh, to be on the world stage. So I'm very, very proud of what we're doing here. Excellent. Uh, Will, what would the provincial government do to support innovation in education and training? What haven't we done? <laughs> what else will you do? <laughs> That's a better question. Um, we knew when we took office we needed 100,000 new tradespeople in the province of Ontario over the next 10 years. That has not changed. Um, we have an incredible Minister of uh, Training and Labour. And, and what I love about our community is that we have these incredible institutions that can hit the ground running in finding innovative ways of finding those solutions. Whether that's, and, and it's not just skilled trades, it's not, and you know, the first thing we did was get rid of the College of Trades, and now we have Trades Ontario, which has streamlined all of those things so much. And that's just one piece of it, though. I think it takes a revolution in our educational system also. You know, I've been, I've been watching some of the things that have been done in other jurisdictions and how kids in kindergarten can learn hands-on skills directly. You know, I'll never forget when I was sitting with um, uh, the, 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 the gentleman that owned, their, because they're both bigger than I am, father and son, at, uh, at Gem Strapping. And, and the dad said, uh, my, 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 they're the last manufacturer, uh, Canadian uh, manufacturer left of metal strapping that goes around the loads of lumber that you see and things like that. And he goes, my, I have two questions in my interview and the guy's hired if he wants a job or she. Question one is, I put a tape measure on the table and I asked him what that is. <laughs> Most people don't know. <laughs> Question two, if the answer is yes, is please measure my desk and tell me what the numbers are. If they can do that, they get a job offer. And they're not paying $15 an hour. They're paying $20 an hour and, and higher. 
So it's not just skilled trades. We've done huge work on that. That's why we have so many friends in the blue collar labor union place because they recognize whether it's the Brotherhood of Electricians or LIUNA or even Unifor on, on those, those issues. It's skilled workers. You know, if you have some good basic skills in communication and things like that, you can get a job in this community in manufacturing for well over $20 an hour uh, immediately. And it's finding those. So it's putting those pieces in place and getting the kids interested in going down those roads, breaking down some of the stigma that's associated with those pieces. And we have a lot of work yet to go because we have 300,000 jobs available here for people who want them. And, and it's that micro-credentialing. And again, our partners in the community, whether it's the Brand Skills Center too, or the Great Center on Six Nations Territory, working directly with employers to develop programs that do that and the conversations that I have with the people that deliver those uh, services and educational experiences so that we can get people, it's, it's so exciting to be a part of because there's so much opportunity. And so, got a good start, long way to go, but we're on that road and I have great partners here who do that with me. Well, we have time for one last question. Uh, the riding that you both represent, we're here in the city of Brantford, is not just an urban riding. It is uh, significant in the agricultural and natural resources sector as well. Uh, but those sectors are under tremendous pressure with mm -hmm. labor shortages, growth in demand, climate change challenges. Uh, what is your level of government willing to do to support farmers and natural resources in a sustainable way? Will. Oh, I get to go first? Yes. Sorry, Larry. <laughs> uh, internet and gas, number one. We are overseeing the most dramatic increase in uh, connectivity in rural areas of the province ever. Putting in what, a billion and a half? Um, in a reverse um, auction type of program because we have a goal of 2025 to see all areas of the province reached by either wire, uh, glass, or um, satellite. And putting that in place. Farmers today, need to be able to move at the speed of business, which means they can't be on nothing or dial-up. And uh, it remains the single biggest in industry in this community, period. And uh, to be able to get that connectivity is critical. And we're making those investments in order to actualize those things. And uh, whether it's through SWIFT or through other service providers to get that out on the ground. Uh, number two is natural gas. And if anyone's curious about how the program works, we all pay a buck a month, and that goes into a fund that is getting natural gas out into different areas in our community. I've seen those expansion plans along with the internet plans. Um, not, nothing happening directly here, but across different parts of the province in order to get those services in place. <coughs> Innovative programs, um, Conestoga, and doing the, a tractor ain't just a tractor, it's a driving computer. And um, to be able to offer the programs so that we can have those skilled workers in place to have the training that they need in order to operate the machinery necessary today was such a great announcement. And, and to have the partners who can make those programs happen on the ground quickly and efficiently. And, and those are just some of the pieces that we're putting in place in order to support agriculture. I'll get, leave with one example. Um, Medical Officer of Health in Windsor, Essex, um, had concerns, wrote a letter, would have uh, completely screwed up the greenhouse industry, and we would have lost $200 million of food this year. Through the incredible work of our Minister of Agriculture, recognizing the critical nature of food security in the province of Ontario, in 72 hours, dealt with those concerns at a municipal um, level, at a, at a Ministry of Health level, um, uh, in order to have that letter rescinded. Not because those concerns weren't legitimate by the Medical Officer of Health, but because we could work together in order to solve those problems. And that's just one of the ways, small ways, 72 hours, three days, we had that issue resolved. Because if it would have gone on a week, it would have been catastrophic for that whole economy down there. And, and that's the kind of turn around quick, get things done that uh, how we solve issues in agriculture. 
Thank you, Will. Uh, Larry, I gave Will the, the first yeah. word, but you can have the last on this question. Yeah, uh, nothing that my friend has said, I, I, I disagree with. Those are all great in, uh, initiatives. We also take, have to take a look at supply chain issues. We have to ensure that uh, you know we can get our product to the producers and the manufacturers as soon as possible. To do that, we have to ensure that they have the essential workforce. We have to ensure that uh, any so seasonal workers or temporary workers uh, can be fast-tracked uh, through the immigration system with a view ultimately of increasing our overall workforce, uh, expediting the permanent residency status of those individuals, taking advantage of more world markets, opening up the product. Like we have the, the best the best of the best in terms of what we can produce, uh, particularly in Western Canada. We need to diversify our markets to ensure that they are very, very competitive and have more resources that they can, they can ship those uh, products to. And just, uh, just developing and encouraging diversification within the farming system itself, taking advantage of technologies. But on a local level, I wholeheartedly agree with my friend. I've heard this numerous times. It was a hot topic. Uh, during the election campaign, it was a platform for all the major parties to ensure that there is that connectivity. It is absolutely crucial in today's today's day and age. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I'll, I'll reiter reiterate my gratitude for uh, you joining us today. Uh, the conversation was riveting. I'm sure we could have gone on for another hour, plus or minus a couple of minutes. Uh, <laughs> But uh, once again, thank you, Larry and Will, for joining us today. Your commitment to our community, your service for the public is just, uh, our, our words cannot appreciate that enough. Thank you. So again, I'd uh, like to call attention to the uh, donations made to charity on, uh, on your behalf, the Why Not Youth Center, uh, Crossing All Bridges. Thank you again to Pink's Productions for uh, your wonderful technical support here today. Uh, and again, our post-secondary uh, education centers and sponsors today, Conestoga College, Wilfrid Laurier Brandt, and of course, Six Nations Polytechnic. Uh, please. Uh, feel free to mingle. I think we have a few more minutes before they kick us out of here. Uh, thank you to uh, the Best Western for hosting us again. And uh, again, uh, really appreciate everyone coming out here today. Uh, we know it's a little bit different, a little bit challenging coming back out into society again. Uh, but I certainly welcome it. And uh, I thank you all for, for coming here today.